Welcome to the Permaculture Podcast with Scott Mann. We're here with Trad Cotter, author of Organic Mushroom Farming and Microremediation. We're at the Mother Earth News Fair today, and later on, Trad will be giving a presentation on medicinal mushrooms. And while we're here, Trad, I'd like you to give us kind of a rundown of what that talk will be about and what people can expect, as well as just some information for the listeners about how they can use mushrooms for their health. Okay. Um, well, the talk is, um, I think, a good cross-section of, uh, first of all, letting everyone know how mushrooms produce medicinal compounds, which I think is important to know that it's very important. It's, uh, when you're growing and cultivating a mushroom, how you cultivate it reflects the quality of the medicinal compounds. So the first, I would say the first few minutes, we're going to be discussing life cycles. Um, you can't get them, you can't use mushrooms for medicine unless you know how to grow them. So we're going to, for everyone, I always do a very simple lead in, a few slides on the life cycles of mushrooms, period. Uh, and that also evolves into um, how mushrooms behave in nature. Um, so it's, it's just one chapter short of calling it mushroom psychology, which, uh, which is an interesting uh, phenomenon, how mushrooms react in nature. So uh, a lot of the slides that I'll be showing um, is shows behavioral galleries between mushrooms and bacteria, things that you don't you can't really see in the wild. But when you get them on petri plates, it's very easy to watch these little gladiator matches. And um, and I joke joke with everyone. I said, you know, this is why I don't have cable, because this is too much fun. You know, making these little galleries and watching fungi and bacteria battle it out is how I learn more about what mushrooms are capable of. So. Um, when, when everyone is on board about how a mushroom grows and how they react to their environment, that's what produces those medicinal compounds. So what I'm teaching is essentially fungi are like chemical factories, like assembly lines, right? They're tooled to make just about anything. Um, and some mushrooms are better than others, you know, they're omnivores and they make a lot of different compounds, right? And some are very specific. They, in nature, they grow on very specific food sources. So their key set, you know, if you imagine mushrooms having keys that break down different things in nature, they're gonna have a very limited key set, maybe one key or two keys to break down, let's say a magnolia cone or a specific insect. They're not gonna grow on anything else. So their, their medicinal properties may be, may be a little bit limited, if that makes sense. Um, the omnivores have a huge key set. So those are the ones with a very large assembly line. And what, we're be, what we've been doing is dosing those mushrooms with different compounds to induce them, the workers on the assembly line, to produce something else. Totally new. Yeah. Um, so um, in cultivating mushrooms, we're also going to cover um, some very simple methods. Maybe three mushrooms, three method, methods that could be expanded to almost any type of medicinal mushroom. Um, I, did, I used to do garden design and landscape design for a living until I went mushroom uh, pro <laughs> and quit my day job but um, I have a very I think keen sense of landscape design and layout um, and a flow and uh, the synergism between plants and mushrooms is very very important and I think when you place a mushroom garden in the right spot um, and it has everything that it needs the quality of the, the medicinal compounds is going to come through so um, essentially teaching in the class how to be um, a good orchestrator of mushroom mycelium, um, mushroom husbandry, that's what I call it. Um, well, the last, probably the, the last, um, uh, is included inside the lecture will also be um, creating mushroom extracts and tinctures. All right, so that's listed in the program. And I think that's really important to know how to extract the medicinal properties correctly. There's um, Mushrooms are made of chitin, uh, which is a very hard mineral substance. And uh, anyone who eats a mushroom raw, and I, I quizzed everybody in my last lecture, a lot of hands went up, and I said, don't do it anymore, because it's a chemical lock. Chitin is a hard mineral substance, and it's binding. All of the protein and the medicinal compounds are woven into that matrix, and heat, just a little bit of heat, loosens the grip on everything. So if you're, if you're not cooking your mushrooms, start doing it. Um, and you also lessen the risk of any kind of um, small uh, heat unstable molecules that might be, you might be allergic to. So anyone who's eating wild mushrooms, especially cook them 
and you will increase the level of um, safety dramatically and also increase the levels of protein, uh, medicinal compounds, and vitamins you get out of a cooked mushroom. Plus, they'll taste better. <laughs> they'll taste a lot better. Um, making the extracts and tinctures, I think, is important because um, they can be quite expensive. Um, and these are wonderful healing properties. I think everybody should be able to uh, make them inexpensively or free at home. Uh, you can do hot water extractions. You can do uh, ethanol extractions very easily and they're extremely stable. So I'm teaching everyone to make their own medicine, mushroom medicines based on um, the particular pathogen or um, disease in mind. So we're going to be looking at viruses, we're going to be looking at cancer cells, uh, we're going to be looking at bacteria, um, anything that you've seen in the news lately, essentially there's going to be a mushroom for just about anything that ails you. Um, and we're going to uh, try to match up those mushrooms with the causal agent, which would be the pathogen. And um, knowing how to create those tinctures is extremely important because if you make them the wrong way, um, you could be cultivating bacteria or um, you, you might not be getting the medicinal compounds out. So we're going to be teaching that the correct way. What are three medicinal mushrooms that you would recommend everyone start growing as soon as they could? Three medicinal mushrooms that I recommend would be a reishi mushroom, which is also called Ling Chi, and it is a Ganoderma lucidum, Ganoderma curtisii. There's a couple different Ganodermas. They're really easy to grow. They grow on uh, buried logs, so you can drill and, and plug your logs just like you would a shiitake, and then just half bury them, and the reishis will fruit all over it. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a mushroom that takes a while to grow. It's a very slow growing mushroom, but they call it the mushroom of immortality for a reason and um, it really does improve your, your overall balance, uh, your cells, it empowers your immune system to recognize and go after non-self cells, which would be viruses, <laughs> bacteria, um, any kind of pathogen that's in your system. So um, reishi is a very, very good one. Um, turkey tail is another one. Now these are mushrooms that are not directly edible. Uh, you can powder and eat them. Um, but making the extracts is honestly the best, best way to take it. Um, powdering them and mixing them into soup, for instance. Because these mushrooms do not taste good <laughs> at all. It tastes like gourmet cardboard. Um, and powdering them will get it past your tongue and into your system. But turkey tails are wonderful for cancers right now. Um, I know the FDA, uh, I don't know why, approved um, are involved with approving turkey tail mushrooms as an adjunct therapy to vaccines and cancer. So it's been working. Turkey tails in Japan are the number one cancer treatment therapy, number one. They have a very, very low uh, rate of um, side effects, extremely low, which is, which is true to all these medicinal mushrooms. Um, and they also have a very high success rate with combating cancer. And why we're not using that in the US, I mean, I'll let you decide why. <laughs> because it's practically free and their turkey tails are everywhere. But now that can change. And turkey tails are wild, they're easy to ID, and you can grow them. Um, probably the third would be, um, you know, there's a lot of different, I'm picking, I'm picking, uh, it's hard to pick. Maitake mushrooms are really good. Um, but honestly, the, uh, going into flu season, I would probably recommend shiitake mushrooms for the reason that they are extremely high in antiviral compounds. Um, oh, and if, when you pair them up, now I'm talking about these three, when you take a blend, what that does is give you a cocktail. And that's typical of the medicinal industry to give you a cocktail of things um, and your body reacts to, to them. But when you blend, let's say the reishi and the turkey tail and shiitake, and maybe add a fourth called cordyceps, these three or four mushrooms are amazing together. Um, and they're, they're extremely efficient at deactivating viruses, um, uh, coding their, their, um, their attachment points to keep them from replicating. If they can't replicate then they, they, or attach, they can't replicate. So there's a couple different levels where stopping viruses and pathogens occurs. And if you're taking a blend, that's the best thing to do. And then would you like to share your breaking news with us about your work in the world of mushrooms? Okay, so um, patent file just got it back, and I think this is awesome. This is a, uh, what's been described as the paradigm shift in medicine. So um, while I was working on 
a micro-remediation experiment specifically involving biofuel. Um, I was making galleries for bacteria and fungi together because they work together to break things down in nature. So what I noticed was that in these galleries, the fungi were acting and the bacteria were acting really odd. Um, it was like a, watching a gladiator match. So when I put the shiitake mushroom, for instance, on the plate, and I put the two pellets of bacteria to, to watch them battle it out, the bacteria sped away um, two to three inches off the plate in 12 hours. So what that told me was, that, hmm, you know, this shiitake's got some pretty powerful uh, components to it, and this bacteria doesn't want to go anywhere near that shiitake. All right, so it's being very defensive and, and leaving, trying to get off the plate. So what I also noted, noticed when I zoomed in, uh, I take a lot of pictures, and even a, even a regular digital camera, um, it's, it's high enough megapixel where um, you will notice things when you zoom in on the picture, when you get it on the computer, that you don't see with your naked eye. So what I saw was these tiny little droplets all over the shiitake mycelium, um, very fine little droplets. Okay. So when I, I found that when pairing shiitake mycelium and aspergillus together, um, it completely grew over the top of this other mold and just carpet bombed the entire fungus and it produced a lot of metabolites this time. So what that told me was I could basically trigger a, a biomass of mycelium to produce a very novel specific compound exclusively for any organism. Alright, so let's try to wrap our head around this one. Alright, you go into the hospital, okay, you get, you have strep throat, what do they do? They take a throat culture, they gag you for free, and then they streak it, and they figure out which antibiotic's going to work for you. Probably everyone's taking about the same antibiotics. This is like, you know, we're, we're herds of cattle, so we're all taking the same thing. What this does is, now this is, the, this is the hospital of the future kind of a patent. You go in with your strep throat, you go into my lab in that hospital, we streak your strep. All right, we grow it, it only takes a couple hours. We, on a block of mycelium that's been stored, you put that liquid culture right on top of this little module inside this well, and within 24 hours, that mushroom block creates a cocktail exclusively for your strain, personal, DNA finger typed for your strep. And it's a cocktail that is full of different compounds. It's not one molecule, so it's not FDA regulated, which is beautiful, right? So it's a, subs it's a supplemental uh, product that, that so far has been working with staph, salmonella, E. coli, you name it. Um, when you think about all the diseases and viruses could be next, where we put a virus or cancer cells in the well and it creates a unique suspension for every single patient. And that's the way the, the future has to be with medicine because in two years our antibiotics are no good. Um, they're mutating, and it takes 10 to 20 years to get a new FDA-approved antibiotic drug on the market. So I'm asking everyone, everyone knows the answer, but who's winning the race? <laughs> We're not. <laughs> so we need new products, but we need more specific, target-specific, on an individual basis, and that's what this does.